One thing we know for sure is that literacy transfers. You learn to read once in your life. When you learn to read, that ability goes with you to your next language. So this business of decoding, you learn once in your life. You probably all took foreign languages, and when you went in in high school or wherever, college, whatever it was, your ability to code and all your life experience and your academic knowledge went with you. And you looked at the book in German, probably or French or Spanish, and you could already decode. You just had to put meaning onto that. Okay, the water lily so captures what language acquisition is about. Um, I don't know if you know how a water lily grows. Any guesses? What happens under the surface there? Why are those things thriving? What makes a water lily function and grow so beautifully? Do you know what's under the water? Any guesses? Roots, okay. Keep thinking about roots. Keep thinking. We can think of nutrients from below. We can think of nutrients of sun from above. But we're thinking about roots. What do those roots look like? If I have a water lily here and it's thriving and there's another lily pad here, I wonder what's going on underneath the surface. Yes. Yes. This second lily gains its strength, life thrives from the first, from the primary. Think of the primary identity. The reason this one grows and thrives is because of the primary root. This is why we honor, respect, celebrate primary language, primary culture, the primary identity. Okay, water lily still. This comes totally scooting of Congress. Okay, look at the water lily. One water lily, see the well-developed roots growing? Okay, if we want that lily, students, to thrive and grow, go to the second picture, you will see if we whack off the roots underneath, you know we're going to kill the water lily. However, you know what happens, that lily floats, looks okay, sounds okay, seems okay, you know, second, third grade, kind of floating along on the surface, looks like they're okay. But if you really want that water lily to grow and thrive, you have to strengthen the primary root because the second grows from that iceberg. Look at all that is below the surface. All that is unseen in language acquisition, culture, it's everything that's below the surface that matters. Culture, language, heritage, history below the surface, unseen by many eyes. And certainly, you've seen it happen. Okay, this is an iceberg also. Look at the part, the iceberg that's above, on your left, on your left up there. That is the English or Spanish or Chinese of the child as they walk into the classroom. Okay, do they, that's what's seen and heard in this case. It's a surface feature. But it's everything that's below the surface that enhances what's above the surface, too. You know that. And what's below the surface in language acquisition we call, there's a couple names for it, but common underlying proficiency. It is your academic knowledge. It is your history in schools. It's all that you've learned. Now, in U.S. schools, what we want is over here. We want the kids to move into what's above the surface, English, really quickly. We want it to be seen and heard. We want the English over here. The way they will get English more rapidly and more effectively 
is because of the rich academic experience below the surface. All of that goes with them to the next language, just like you when you took foreign language. All of your learning beforehand, all your literacy, all your experiences went with you and made that language acquisition happen more happen quickly. When Einstein came to the United States, he spoke German. But all that was below the surface for him, down here, under the sea, went right with him. All the knowledge came right with him and made English acquisition come more quickly. Foreign exchange students, when they go to another country, all their literacy, all their knowledge, everything below the surface goes right with them. That's why they acquire the next language quite quickly. So Jim Cummins, dual iceberg, um, common underlying proficiency. Threshold hypotheses. This is one of the toughest things. And I want you to remember it. Just remember, the th see the three pillars shooting up into the sky? See the three pillars? That's how you remember this. Our friend Jim Cummins. He, he said early on, he said, you know, there's different kinds of bilingualisms. There's different ways of being bilingual. He said, there's the tall pillar you're looking at. <clears throat> he said, I'm going to call that proficient bilingualism. You've got a lot of English in this case and a lot of Spanish. This is proficient bilingualism. I got a lot of Spanish, I got a lot of English. Now, what are the predictable cognitive effects for proficient bilingualism? All positive cognitive effects. If you are proficient bilingual, I know cognitively you're going to succeed. So if we want kids to to succeed cognitively and to achieve. Okay, and then Jim hypothesized back then. There's another kind of bilingual. He called it, look at the middle pillar, he called it partial bilingualism. You got a little bit of English, a little bit of Spanish, or vice versa. So his question was, what are the predictable effects of being a partial bilingual? Well, it turns out it doesn't hurt you, it doesn't help you. It doesn't hurt cognitively and it doesn't help cognitively. So you can say neither positive nor negative. He said there's another type of bilingual. And he said, I'm going to label this a limited bilingual. This is the person who has a little bit of one language and a little bit of another language. A little bit of English, a little bit of Spanish. And then Jim said, what do we know from research? What do we know from data? What are the effects of being a partial bilingual? And tragically, we now know there are negative cognitive effects. This comes from Jim Cummins, and I got it out of his 2001 book, but the effects of being bilingual. If you're on one wheel, Jim says, one language can get you places. One wheel works. One language works, no problems. And then look at your next one with the big wheel and the little wheel. And so what if you got a big wheel and a little wheel? Well, so you can still get around if you're a big one and a little one. However, Jim says, what if, now look at the middle picture of the wheels. What if your wheels are nicely balanced, fully inflated? You'll go farther and faster. Very good, huh? Now watch the next one. Watch that bottom picture. Provided, of course, the people who made the wheels knew what they were doing. One last graphic. This came from a group of students in the Central Valley who put this together. I think it's fabulous. They put this together and um, two people in particular, Gina Grinch and the other one was Vern Hickson, and they handed in this picture of this house. 
And I said, what is it? And now if you look at it closely, I'll tell you the parts of the house. They said, this is the bilingual family. And I said, help me out. And if you'll look behind the house, there's two hills kind of behind the house. Can you see those mm -hmm. two? It's kind of light on the screen up there. They said, that's to remind us of the dual iceberg. That's to remind us of it's what's below the surface. Pretty good, huh? Can you see the red door where they go in? Can you see the windows in the red door? This is to remind us of the threshold hypotheses. Pretty good. Look at the window. Can you see a quadrant in the window? Jim Cummins quadrant? Now, see the cup in the window? Cup, common, underline, proficiency. Very good, huh? I think excellent. And they said that's to help us remember what bilingual ed is about.